Thank you very much for staying and welcome back to the Markets Place. Now to our very first story, the visiting IMF staff mission to Ghana is expected to begin work today to assess the country's performance under the fund program so far. The exercise could impact positively on the proposed IMF board meeting and the release of some $500 million from donors. George Riafi has more. The IMF team, which is led by its mission chief, Joel Tijas Bennett, arrived in the country yesterday and they are expected to jet out, possibly this Friday. The team is expected to look at the impact of the passage of the Bank of Ghana Act, which allows government to borrow up to 5% of previous year's revenue from the Bank of Ghana on the fund program, work on the payment of the state-owned organization's debt on commercial banks and assessing the country's fiscal situation. The visit has been influenced by difficulties by government in meeting some critical targets under the program, which forced the IMF to review the proposed date for its board meeting to approve Ghana's performance under the third review on two occasions. The fund is now proposing the middle of next month as the new date based on meeting some critical conditions. But this uncertainty hasn't gone down well with some economists like Dr. Joe Abi to worry this development could badly affect the economy. There can be very serious implications for investors if the fund were to be to say that, sorry, we are unable to get the approval of senior management to take a clear recommendation to our board. Then, watch out for ratings agencies, newswire services, investors, the, the yields on your euro bond may take a hit. But for Deputy Minister of Finance Monacote, government is committed to the fund program and or pass a third review. There are a few things that we need to meet in order to come to the conclusion of the third review so that the uh, fund can go to their board. We will finish those things. It is work in progress and I uh, trust me, Ghana will conclude, which is for three years, will conclude it successfully. But some, this visit is critical because it could lead to the release of some $500 million from the country's donor partners who are waiting for Ghana to pass the third review before the funds come in and also convince some investors who had initially shied away from the country's fifth eurobond issue to raise some $500 million. This could lead to the capital coming in if Ghana passes the third review. All right, so we shall be assessing the implications of this particular development, that is, if there is a delay in passing Ghana's economy under the fund program, or if even the board decides to negate that activity, what implications are there for businesses and investment in the country? And, of course, we've been joined by financial analyst Charles Mensah to share his thoughts on this particular issue. Good afternoon. And welcome to Marketplace, Charles. Good afternoon, sir. How are we doing? We are fine. Now, currently, the, the staff mission of the IMF is in Ghana to assess the country's performance so far. What happens if they decide that finally Ghana did not pass the performance? What will happen to investments and business? Well, first and foremost, um, yes, it will send some signals to increase our risk if the IMF gentlemen and ladies decide to put a plug or decide to say we are not part of the approval process as has been agreed. Mm. It will send a signal. That means that we, we are high risk. And now when you're high risk, if you're raising at the next uh, round of bonds, the, the price would definitely go up. Uh, the rate that the investors which have would definitely go up. So I pray that uh, we will not have any negative reports from the IMF. But if we do, it will have a, a repercussion on investment, yes. So what exactly are some of these repercussions, especially on businesses and investments, some of who are waiting to hear the outcome of, of such a, a, a review? No, as for, as for a business decision to invest in a particular country, mm -hmm. it goes beyond um, just IMF. But the cost, the, because every business will come in and go and borrow from uh, fund managers. Mm -hmm. Now when you borrow from the fund managers, it comes at a cost. 
and the cost or the rate is fixed based on risk, you know, and risk premium. It is it's added to certain basis. Now, what then happens is that if, as soon as this uh, IMF issues a report, and which is negative, it increases our risk premium. So the cost of investment into a country would definitely would go up. But that does also mean that they will not invest, but then the cost will really go up. And if cost of investment goes up, it has implication on the consumer, it has implication on a number of things. So that's what happens. Mm. So and inflation will definitely also go up. So it has serious linkages. Mm. It will not mean that they will not invest in a country, but then the risk is high. So the returns would equally be high. So what what could uh, what could be the implications also on government's uh, eurobond issue? It means that the next uh, trend, if we should go, it would be very high. The price that the investors would uh, request us to pay uh, for the returns would be very, very high because the uh, people that they are relying upon, which is IMF and other things, are saying that, look, this is negative. Now, once it's negative, it says uh, risk up and then the rate up. And that's what we are going to have. So I hope that we'll have a, a positive uh, response from the IMF, you know, mm. will have a positive, because if you have a negative response, it will, it will not work well for us at all. Now, Charles, do you think that a negative response is kind of imminent in the country, especially when we've gone through two other, two or three other, you know, um, review processes and we've, become out, we've come out as successful? Do you think this particular development is too worrying for us as a country? If what I'm hearing is correct, I think it's to do with the um, the zero borrowing and all the calculations that they said that look mm. you can you can't borrow you know no matter where I over allowed you to borrow in excess of five percent no more than five percent of the previous year's revenue mm. so and the argument now is that you can't because I am for pushing them to do zero now <clears throat> if what I'm hearing is correct um, I think they've come to some comp- uh, compromise that it would be between uh, zero and two and a half percent if mm. that is what you agree that's not a negative thing that means that the, uh, they have reviewed the figures from zero to two point five. So just let's let's wait and see and hope and see that it doesn't. Uh, they don't issue complete negative, but then they will agree on a certain compromise. Because if in the previous two years, the two reviews you have approved for us to go forward, and the third review, certain things are not happening right. You just have to correct and point it out, rather than saying that I am out of the game because you. Uh, watching and giving guidelines onto the game. So we have to find a way to get a medium level where we can say that, yes, we are doing the 2.5 or we are doing 3% or we are doing 4% so that the country itself would move forward. But in terms of investment, yes, investment will come, but it will come at a higher cost. Finally, if, if it should happen this way, what should be the direction of government? I mean, if a lot of investors decide to hold back their investment because of this particular review program. What would be the, the, the direction, the action that government should take? It's, I think it's, it has to be renegotiation uh, for, and then we have to find a way mm. to set a story to other investors, I mean specific investors to specific sectors. Because like I said, there are sectors like the energy sector, like the mining sector, like oil sector, they are investing all right because people are knocking at the door to invest in those areas. But the cost of their funds is what is going to be up. So when it is that IMF had issued or had redone or had issued any, any negative thing, it will just affect the cost. But the principle of the investment will remain, but it's just a cost. Okay. So right. it would be government then to go forward and negotiate with some of this. Maybe they can throw in some of the tax rebates as a way to uh, 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 welcome them to come into invest in country, you know, mm. part of the attraction. Because if you if you don't get it at this point, you can get it at this point. So if the cost of funds is higher, and I'm throwing in a tax rebate or a tax incentives or investment incentives for you to come in, when you calculate the overall cost, it will be your cost of funds and then the tax. So the tax right. can be negative, and you reduce the cost of funds, and that in itself cannot be an attractive point. All right, thank you very much, Charles Mensah. Charles Mensah is a financial analyst. He's been sharing his thoughts on the fact that the IMF review mission is currently in the country trying to actually consider the performance of Ghana's economy so far under the fund program. Now, moving on, Fidelity Bank had described its Bank of the Year achievement as a vote of confidence 
in a Ghanaian bank that should spur other indigenous entities onto greater heights. Now, the bank emerged winner of the 15th edition of the bank Ghana Banking Award. Eighty Bank beat 27 other banks to clinch the coveted award after winning the best bank in corporate social responsibility and trade deal of the year. The Deputy Managing Director, Jim Baden, explains to Joy Business, this couldn't have come at a better time. This award means so much to us. Uh, this year marks our 10th anniversary and every year we've come here, we've missed it narrowly. This year, we kind of felt that we win it because last year our financial performance was very, very strong. Our trade business was very strong also, and therefore, we kind of felt that we were there, and I'm happy we've won it. We've won it for our customers, and we've won it for our staff as well. In all, 15 award categories were competed for, which covered the operations of the banks in 2015. Other winners were Bank of Africa, which won the best customer service advisory bank and Stambic Bank Ghana, picking up the Product Innovation of a Year Award. Prudential Bank won the best customer care category, which was sponsored by the Multimedia Group Limited. Bank of Baroda was adjudged the best in competitive pricing, whilst the best bank in agri category went to ADB. The two categories sponsored by the Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement Systems Gibbs to promote electronic cash transactions over the use of physical cash were picked by Zenith Bank, which won the most active e-payment cashless award, and GCB adjudged the most active e-switch bank. Meanwhile, the managing director for Cal Bank, Frank Edugenia, was honored as the longest serving MD of a Ghanaian-owned bank. Four other bankers, including former Ecobank Group CEO, Arbetesian, and former UT boss, Kofi Amabin, also received Lifetime Achievement Awards. Mr. Asian later spoke with Joy Business. I'm really humbled, and uh, I'm happy that I've been able to go through and made a little contribution to the banking and finance industry in Ghana. The remaining two bankers who received the Lifetime Awards were Joseph Nibudutete, and Philip Boabi. This year's edition of Ghana Banking Awards was under the theme Enriching a Healthy Competitive Landscape in the Drive for Customer Relevance in Banking. Meanwhile, the Bank of Ghana has charged banks to reposition themselves for the smooth implementation of the de Deposit Protection System. Deputy Governor Dr. Johnson Isiama spoke at the Banking Awards ceremony. Bank of Ghana, in co collaboration with the German government, will soon establish a deposit protection system in Ghana for the first time in our history. This will ensure protection for small depositors and enhance the safety of the financial system. Hopefully, this should lead to increased deposit mobilization for investment and growth. The implementation of the deposit protection scheme may, however, and I need to point that out, pose serious challenges to undercapitalized institutions as well as institutions that breach regulatory and prudential. You're live on the market, please. We're taking a short break. We'll be right back after this. Thanks for staying and welcome back to the marketplace. The Ghana National Gas Company is to shut down their turbo gas processing plant for 10 days. The shutdown, which will start from this particular Wednesday, is to help carry out some routine maintenance works on the facility, which is located in the Western Region. Communications Director of Ghana Gas, Alfred Obami, tells Joy Business the shutdown is also part of an insurance requirement for the plant. There's a plant maintenance shutdown, uh, scale one. Uh, coming uh, from the 31st to the 7th um, and indeed so all these things will be replaced. These are not things that have been as, have expired. Mm -hmm. or these are not parts that have expired. These are working parts that would expire on the demand. That is why we are shutting the plant down to replace these um, uh, parts. It's just sad that you would have people working at a plant who are aware of these developments. I plan that you know, release over a month ago. Mm. I have it on my computer. Indeed, 
I'm actually contemplating whether to even issue it out today. Because mm. my plan was to do so over the weekend against Monday. But what about the contractual issues that they raised with management, the Chinese and the Ghana guys, and which they believe that has an impact on their service conditions? I do not see how that has an impact on their service conditions. First and foremost, what are the issues they're raising? We are ready to take over and manage. There is an ONM contract. A contract for which even the funding became available to us to construct the pipeline. What does the contract say? It says that for the first two years, you're going to have the Chinese run the plant and impact knowledge to our Ghanaian, okay? Our Ghanaian staff. That two years have been handed. You have a contract, a working contract. You can't go and just resend it on the basis of some wishes of staff who feel that, oh, now if we've learned how to do it, let them go. There's no NM contract for three years. First two years, the Chinese run the plant. The Ghanaians sit back and watch and learn. The f two years will end at the end of next month. Then in the third year, the Ghanaians run the plant. The Chinese sit back and supervise. Well, it is, however, not clear for now how the shutdown could affect power supply in the country. This is because the Volta River Authority, VRA, recently imported significant volumes of crude to deal with any shortfall in gas supplies for power generation. Now, in a related development, some workers at uh, the plant demonstrated last week, uh, Friday, have, who demonstrated last week, have been prevented from working at the plant by some military personnel. That's what we are getting right now. And local union chairman, Ghana Gas, Sumaila Muhammad, will join us to give us some explanation um, to this particular development. But moving on, the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers in Ghana has passed a resolution inviting the Na National Petroleum Authority, the downstream regulator of Ghana's petroleum industry, to clarify the energy sector levy in relation to the long outstanding toll debt. The Chamber says little is being done to account for the numerous taxes Ghanaians are currently paying on petroleum products. There's more in this report. Petroleum prices have not seen the expected reduction despite stability in global crude prices and a relative stability in the value of the CD. This can largely be attributed to several tax components in the petroleum price buildup. One such taxes which has become controversial is the Tor Debt Recovery Levy that continues to reflect in the petroleum price buildup despite several criticisms over the years. The Council of the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, after a meeting in Accra, said its checks reveal that the debt by the refinery has escalated from 70 million Ghana CD to 950 million despite collection of the Tor Recovery Levy. Another tax component is the new energy sector levy introduced in the 2016 budget as part of measures to mobilize funds to deal with the nation's energy deficit. Speaking to Joy Business, Chairman of the Council, Professor Felix Asante, expressed concerns on double taxation in the petroleum levies. We've noticed that there are a lot of levies which is very difficult to appreciate and understand. And we've seen even double taxation within it. Okay, so we've asked the, 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 the executive secretary to do further analysis and further consultations and give us feedback in terms of why those um, levies and the reasons behind it. According to the chamber, Petroleum consumers are being cheated by the various oil marketing companies. OMCs in the country as a result of failure to comply with the petroleum price deregulation policy. The Executive Secretary of the Industry and Commercial Workers Union, Solomon Kota, said they would verify from beneficiary institutions to find out whether generated revenue is being utilized appropriately. He also hinted of seeking legal interpretation into some of the tax laws. You will appreciate that the council is being careful to say that let us in the first place do some kind of um, uh, fact finding. Okay, we have seen the various levies, we have seen the beneficiary institutions. The next question is for the council to find out whether the beneficiary institutions are actually receiving what is due them and if they are also getting it, how are they also applying it. The issues of double taxation that have also come out clearly in this presentation is something that we will get back to the parliament and find out whether they were aware when they were passing those, you know, because all our levies we saw over here, they've they been passed by law. So has the law, you know, 
duplicated itself in that order. Chairman of the Ghana Private Road and Transport Union, GPRTU, Kwame Nkrumah, called for proper implementation of the deregulation policy. We are, we are, we are surprised to hear that uh, they are collecting all these monies and still the, pri the, the debt is going up. So we wrote to them for them to come and explain it to us. Because if there is a debt and we are paying, the debt is supposed to go down. But if it's still going up, they, they should try and come and explain it to us. For us to go to this first, uh, filling station and buy it different price and go here and buy a different price, we are not satisfied about that. We want the price to become stable. If you are buying here, Ten series, it should go the whole Ghana. We're supposed to get it ten series because the prices we are taking from here to uh, Tamale or from here to Cape Coast and Takrade, we are not changing the, uh, the fare. So, for us to tell us that you buy it here and go the different region and go and buy a different price, that will other way for us. Well, on that note, we draw the curtain down on this particular edition of the Marketplace. Thank you very much. For your attention and of course you join me again same time tomorrow for another interesting edition in the meantime you can catch me live on business live at 5 p.m my name is imano abwaji you can get interactive with us by tweeting at joy business gh is the handle by facebook enjoy business is our page and for more business news log on to myjoyonline.com business have a good afternoon